Good morning again. Wonderful to welcome you here to our church. And uh, we are glad to come into the house of the Lord and worship together. If you're new to our church, we have a thing called kit cards. And on your way in, you may have been accosted by our ushers and welcome team reminding you that we have kit cards. We're kind of got a press on today. We're going to mention this again later in the service. We're just trying to get up-to-date information because we've discovered that our church directory really has got out of date because you people don't tell us when you move and stuff. That's probably because nobody actually uses mail anymore. But if your information has changed, we're trying to get updates. So remember that, especially if you're new to the church, it's helpful to, for you to get to know us so that we can get to know you as well and exchange some information that well. Uh, in this season of the church, there are a number of things that are getting started. We have what we call our growth opportunities. Primarily, we start our community groups and uh, there's a QR code, it's out at the welcome desk. We are pleased to say we've started one more group. There's now another Sunday evening group. If you've been having trouble connecting with our groups and signing up, there is a new opening. So if you've been looking for a group, sign up for that. And uh, also for service opportunities. We encourage everyone, if you're a part of our church, if you call this church home, we like to say that we celebrate together what we're doing Sunday mornings. We grow together. We are involved in areas that build Christ into our hearts and lives in unique ways. Community groups help us do that. And we also call everybody to serve in some way. Uh, right now, we're looking for some help in a few areas. In our preschool class downstairs on Sunday mornings, we need three particularly male leaders. If you would like to help out with our youngest kids, uh, guys, we need you to help. And so we need three more volunteers there. For our kids zone, which is the uh, kids time on Tuesday nights here at the church, we need another four helpers to make that happen. We get 50 to 60 kids here on a Tuesday night and it's fantastic what happens. Obviously needs a lot of help that way. Uh, junior high, which also happens two days, Tuesday nights. We need three more leaders to help out there. And then our tech team, that's the group of faithful people at the back of the room that makes it so you can hear me, so that you can see the slides, so that the live stream happens. If you have that kind of mindset and talent and gifts, even if you don't, we'd be happy to train you. You basically just need to know how to use a computer, which I would assume 99.9% of you know how to do now, right? So you can learn how to run stuff at the back. So if you'd like to help us out, that's about a once a month kind of commitment on Sunday mornings. Uh, talk to us about that. All of those things can be accessed through the QR code, go online to our church uh, office and figure out what's going on there. Also in this season, as we start up ministries, there's a thing called Discovering James North. This is a series of classes that we put together that if you're new to us as a church, it's we tell you who we are. So there's kind of no surprises down the road. Officially, it's a four-week class that we invite you into. Uh, we have you share your testimony. You meet our leadership. We talk about our doctrine. We talk about our core values and a lot of things like that. And so we invite you. And the full course is Thursdays in October, the 3rd to 24th. We also do this one-time group. That's on two, this Thursday. And it's kind of the prequel because Discover James North is your access into community groups. It's access ultimately into membership as well. And some of you have been around the church now for a year or more and you've helped us serve in some ways. And for whatever reasons, you haven't been able to get into, into Discover James North, the full course. And so we like to put on this one night event just to get you up to speed in a number of things and it helps you get into community groups as well. So if you want to be in a community group, you've been around for a while, you've never done Discover James North, Thursday night is the night for you. And so uh, again, let the office know that you would like to be part of that so we can send you some information to be ready to do that. Uh, a couple of other things going on. This coming Saturday, women, for you, it's the breakfast. Women's breakfast this Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, it's a potluck, and there's a sign-up sheet for that, so that you can be, it's potluck, but it's one of those organized potlucks. You can kind of see what other people are bringing, so we don't get all of one kind of thing. So again, go on our website, sign up, and it helps uh, the ladies prepare. But they're great mornings of fellowship, some teaching, some learning, and getting together that way. And then last but not least, not least by any means, next Sunday night, the 29th, 
is our annual finance meeting. Probably for most people, finance meetings aren't what turn your crank, but an important meeting in the life of our church, right? As members, we're calling all members to come and join us next Sunday night. This is a time for us to review this past year. We've had a fantastic year financially. God has blessed us. It's been really tight, but in the last several weeks, we've just seen God do some great things. We review that. You hear from our staff what's been taking place in their ministries. Also coming plans because we also plan the budget for the next year as well. So it's a very important meeting in the life of our church. Next Sunday, 730. There's going to be an email go out to all of our members and attenders. Members, in a sense, required to be here. Attenders, though, if you've never joined our church or you'd like to have a sense of what goes on, you're invited to come and join us for this meeting. It is a night of celebration and praise and prayer as well. We make some important decisions about uh, our stewardship together. So encouraging you to be here a week, not tonight, next Sunday night, 730. All right, that's it for announcements and things. Let's stand together as we come before the Lord in worship this morning. Let's bow our hearts together. Father, I thank you for gathering us here this morning. Another unique moment when you have called us as a unique group of your family to be here. And Lord, you know every one of us uniquely and individually. And so I pray now that in that, your spirit would guide us and direct us, unite us before you in song, in your word, in our fellowship, and all the things that take place here this morning. Thank you for it. Amen. Good morning. Uh, yeah, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> That's great. I, I kind of expect no response, so, but that was really nice. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hear God's word for you this morning from Ephesians 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Everybody say dead. Wow, this is great. <laughs> this is going better than I thought it would. Uh, you were dead in your sins and transgressions in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who's now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time. All of us gratified the cravings of our flesh and followed its desires and thoughts. Just like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Everyone say, deserving of wrath. Thank you. But because of his, his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy. Everyone say, rich in mercy. Come on, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. Rich in mercy. We're going to sing of his mercy this morning. I invite you to join me lifting your voices to him. Let's start with the chorus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And his mercy is more. Stronger.
Psalm 34. Give me a sec. My phone just locked up on me. Great. We're going to learn a new song together this morning. Several times throughout Scripture, we're instructed to sing new songs to the Lord. And so this morning, I thought we could do that out of Psalm 34. I really like this song because it's fun, uh, but also the words are like straight out of the scriptures. So here are these words from Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord and let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Some say magnify. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man, this poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his people, for those who fear him lack nothing. So I thought we could do a little run through the chorus. Maybe, Stacy, you could throw the chorus up. I don't know if I put that in there or not. I'm pretty terrible at getting the things in order there for Stacy, but she does a great job helping me out. <laughs> uh, the chorus, oh, there it is. It goes a little like this. Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together. Like his word says, I saw the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from every fear. Those who look on him are radiant, they'll never be ashamed, they'll never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from my enemies, the Son of God surrounds his saints, he will deliver them, he will deliver them.
It is good to magnify the Lord together. Amen? Go ahead and have a seat. Thanks for introducing that song, Andrew. Actually, Andrew, the church I grew up in, that was the verse in the side wall. Every Sunday I'd read that verse. Psalm 34, verse 3. That's great. Well, Paul mentioned earlier that we we're going to talk a little bit about the kit card a little longer. And in fact, I want to give you an opportunity to actually fill out your kit card during church. You heard me right. I'm allowing you, inviting you even, to take your phone out grab the QR code and fill this out. What we found and realized recently is that we have a lot of information in our database on lots of people, but not necessarily you. And uh, it's difficult for us to get in touch with you when we have questions or needs we want to, um, uh, to fulfill. And we want to actually ask everyone to fill one out, even if you've done it before, in case you've changed your address or phone number or some new information. Uh, because we also realize we have that. We have outdated information. Um, and it would, would be great also if you would be so inclined, when you have major life events happen, would you let us know? We love to celebrate with you in the office. We, we would probably love to come and, and spend some time with you, maybe pray for you in those, those deeper, darker times. But we want to celebrate the, the highlights in your life as well. So we're asking everyone if you, you can fill out the, the, the card online using the QR code. Or if you need a printed copy, you may have been given one on the way in or there's more on the uh, desk uh, on the way out of this, the door here. Um, but feel free, take a minute now to fill out that card. I'm going to wait a second so you can start it. I feel like I see, should see more heads down right now. Or maybe you already did it this morning, and that's why you're done. That's great. In that case, I am going to introduce our next por portion of the morning. Uh, every now and then we do something called This Time Tomorrow, where we ask someone to come up and share with us a bit about who they are, what they do, and what will they be doing this time tomorrow. And so this morning, we're actually going to invite Fiona Hissen up. And just, you know, this isn't random. I didn't just pick her 
She's prepared. She knows. Uh, but it's opportunity for us to learn about the people in our congregation. And many of you will know that Fiona is the wife of Derek, our associate pastor. And uh, we often hear from Derek, but we never get to hear from Fiona. And so we're glad to have you come join us this morning, Fiona. You can have a seat. So Fiona, yes. tell us who you are, a bit about yourself, and what is it is you do? Uh, well, I'm Fiona. I am married to Derek. Um, we have been attending James North or Houston for eight years now. Uh, together we have three living children, um, nine, eight, and six. Um, I'm sure many of you see them running around causing havoc every Sunday. Um, I am also a social worker, so outside of those roles, I work part-time at a 10-bed residential hospice unit, and I also work part-time doing psychotherapy. Very interesting. It'll come in handy, married to Derek. <laughs> yes, many of my papers have been, he's been my case study, so. Excellent. I wouldn't say it if I didn't love you, Derek, so it's all good. So Fiona, as the name ex ex suggests, what will you be doing this time tomorrow? Yeah, so I'm actually in a new role at the hospice right now. Um, I recently uh, completed my MSW and did my clinical hours at Emanuel House. And then a few months later, they found funding for a part-time social worker um, and asked if I would like to apply. So um, it is a new role to the hospice as well. They've never had a social worker there before. So we're trying to figure it out as we go, as these things happen. But um, this time tomorrow, I normally start my day by meeting with the nurses in the charge station. I check in around how the weekend has gone, um, if there's any um, high needs in the house right now, if there's any family members who need a phone call or a check-in. Um, from there, um, we might go over new admissions, etc. cetera. Um, and I also do a lot of as social workers do, paperwork and system navigation. So it uh, might help people fill out some power of attorney paperwork. Um, if they are um, on ODSP, it might help them navigate what funeral arrangements look like with ODSP. Um, I will also be doing a couple one-to-one -one bereavement support sessions with family members. Um, and then just regular check-ins with residents around how they're doing. If anyone's having some anxiety or depression symptoms, we check in around that and do some assessments as well. Some very important work. Uh, caring for people at end of life is, is often difficult, but so necessary for them and for their family. It's great. Now, given your faith, what challenges or opportunities do you find in, in your work? Yeah, so um, Emmanuel House is run uh, by Good Shepherd, which is a Catholic organization. So there are a lot of values that, uh, of mine that do align with Good Shepherd and Emmanuel House. Oops. Um, I think naturally in end-of-life care or palliative care, um, there's a lot of questions around end-of-life, what that means for people. Um, we often see people reflecting on what their life has been, maybe some regrets or things that they wish they would change. And so it's really cool just to kind of hold hope for people um, and to be able to step into those spaces of questioning and reflecting. Um, yeah, it's a tender time for people, right? So it's a gift and an honor to kind of step into that with them. Um, in terms of challenges, I mean, um, without going into too much detail, there's a lot of conversation around MAID right now. I'm sure everyone knows that. And that's definitely not, um, it's definitely the case in palliative care and hospice as well. So, um, yeah, I think just navigating how do I have those conversations honestly, graciously, um, and un with understanding, right? Yeah. And how does your faith help you in, in these situations? Yeah. Um, again, because I have hope in Christ, I get to hold hope for others as well. Um, I also love that our God is a God of narrative or story. And so I get to step into those stories with other people um, and hear things that maybe they've never shared uh, with others before. Um, and I get to hold those things, which is really special and really hard sometimes too. Um, and
And also, again, I just believe that God is a God of restoration, right? And so one day everything on earth will be restored, but I also believe that he asks us to step into that restorative work now. Um, and so as a student, I did a lot of uh, reconciliation work with family members, maybe who had been estranged from their loved ones for a while, or it was their last wish to kind of see their daughter or a friend that they hadn't seen. Um, yeah, and I believe God is in all of those things, and that is his desire as well. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> and so how can we be praying for you this week and ongoing? Yeah, well, I think Derek and I are both in kind of new roles right now professionally, so prayer for that transition for us and our family would be really helpful. Um, also, we're both in helping professions. <laughs> Right? We carry the stories of people and often like really difficult things. So uh, prayer for protection for us and that we would find time and space of uh, just restoration and rest for us as a couple and a family as well. That's great. We really appreciate both of you and your kids as well. It's uh, so good to be getting to know you this last year. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray for, you, for Fiona and, and Derek and the kids. And also we're going to pray for our kids as we send them out to their time in Kingdom Kids downstairs. Let's bow together. Our Lord and our God, we, we come before you and thank you for the fact that you are majestic. You are holy. You are so superior to anything that we ever experience here on this earth. God, you are the one who created us. You're the one who, who made us. And, and yet, it, throughout our lives, we, we go through seasons of ups and downs. And, and even as we approach end of life, as Fiona shared, God, there are so many needs uh, that we have. And so often, people have no hope. So my first prayer for Fiona is actually that she'll be able to share your love, the hope you give, uh, as, as she serves and works with the folks or the patients uh, in the hospice there. But God, we also pray for her and for Derek and for the kids as, as they navigate this, this next chapter in their life. As, as she mentioned, both, are in, both of them are in these uh, caring roles, supporting people, uh, walking with people, God. And it's a joy to do that, but it also can be uh, difficult at times. To walk through the joys is wonderful, but to walk through the difficulties can be draining, and yet we want to support and be there for, for those around us. So I pray you'd bless them with the time they need to recharge and to support one another as they continue to raise the kids. And God, would you use Fiona in her new role as she works with this new team? God, that you would again instill in her a courage to stand for what, what she knows is right, what you've called her to do. And that uh, through, through Fiona, you would actually service so many people that they might fe feel cared for, they might feel loved, in their, in their final days. We thank you for her heart for serving and caring in that way. God, we thank you for our children. Uh, God, you've blessed this church with lots of kids, and we are so grateful for that, and it's exciting to hear their voices. And God, even now as we uh, release them down to Kingdom Kids, we pray that you would go with them and that you would uh, teach them this morning. Would you work through our teachers that are down there that they might impact the lives of these kids over the weeks and months and years that they get to serve them? And God, may we see salvations occur in our own families, the kids who are being raised, that they might hear about you and they might ask mom or dad or, or their teacher about how to know Jesus. We'd love to hear those stories, God, of, of our own kids coming to know you. We also pray this morning for Pastor Paul as he comes to bring your word. And in a few minutes, God, as he teaches us this morning about prayer, would our ears be open to hear what you have to say to us? Would our hearts be open to obey? And would your spirit work in us to follow those things that you're prodding us with this day? Would we be open hearers? Would you give him the words to say, give him the boldness uh, to say those things and the clarity that we might hear and understand? God, we thank you so much for the way you're working in our lives. And that through that, would you work in those around us, in our families, our friends, our coworkers, our neighborhood, God, that we might be able to share the good news of the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, with those who are near us. God, we thank you for all of this and praise you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Children and up to and junior high are released now to their time uh, downstairs. Approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring, but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King.
To the king in need of nothing, empty-handed, I rejoice. Father, take our praise. We come to you empty-handed for there's nothing you need, but Lord, you want us to come. What a deep and rich privilege that is. You deserve greater glory than we can ever give. As we come to your word this morning, Father, would you open our hearts to receive from you? to hear your voice through your scriptures. Spirit, enthuse us, regenerate us here today. Amen. Have a seat. Radical maturity. Two words that really shouldn't go together. As we have uh, been talking about this, and it's the name of our series, and I got dwelling on it, You know, the idea of radical, it hints of being out of control, being on the edge, pushing the limits of sensibility, you know, being radical. I, in my, I don't know if it's my generation or whatever, but when I think of the word radical, I think of radical dudes and I think of surfers. I don't know why, but radical dude. Do you remember this guy from the Olympics? Did you see this picture? This was astounding. I remember the day that this took place. Gabriel Medina from Brazil, Mexico, from Brazil, Marcio, not Mexico, Brazil, right, won the Olympics. He hit the perfect wave. And at the end of his wave, if you recall, he went up the backside or the front side of the wave, shot off, jumped off his board and did this. Just, and then this photographer caught the moment. It was incredible. He's on the other side of, you know, just everything came together. And the way this guy talks, it was radical, right? He just pushed it to the very limits. They said it was a near-perfect score. 9.9, they scored the wave. I don't really understand surfing, right? But he had this perfect wave. He did it, you know, and he leaps from his board, just this incredible joy. They're calling it radical. He was totally committed, took it to the limits of his sports, The word radical has its idea in the idea of fundamentals, of going back to the basics, of being complete. Pastor Dave has kind of filled that out for us. It's what we want to do as a church family, get back to the basics. In our context, radical is calling us to take our faith to its ultimate conclusion, to live with God on the edge so that we can leap out of our Bibles. <laughs> I don't know what the picture would be. Whatever that picture is that says we are all in. To be overwhelmed by his spirit. To be in his total control. But even as we talk about that. If we're talking about being filled with the spirit. And recognizing his work in us. We realize there's a maturity about that. For the spirit is not the one who lives out of control. The spirit is the one who is full of grace. Grace. His fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, and it's what he calls us to do and to be. And so we want to be radical, we want to be living to the fullest of our faith, but we want to become radically mature, to become who Christ calls us to be. A couple of examples from scripture, Ephesians chapter 4. God grants gifts to his church that the body of the church may be built up in unity for the works to equip his people for works of service. What's verse 13 says? Until we all reach unity in the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Radically mature. Understanding what it is to be fully understanding the fullness of Jesus within us. And what's the response? Then we'll be no longer infants, tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. That's maturity. To be standing firm and strong. James 1 says the same thing. James 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be, let's do what Andrew did, say it, be mature, right? Let it finish its work. You may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. 
So we're radical but mature, not lacking anything. And if you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Interesting, isn't it? James and Paul go to that same kind of picture. You know, immaturity is being blown here and there and tossed about. Maturity is being in that place where you're able to stand in the midst of the storm. Right? Not double-minded is what James finishes off by saying. Radical maturity, growing in knowledge and experience, resulting in able to stand strong in the midst of the rolling seas of life, it's not tossed to and fro, but to borrow from last week's message, standing strong as those who love God with all their hearts and souls and minds and strength living in a reverential fear of the Lord that guides and directs our lives. Both of those passages drive us to what we want to talk about today as well. Because if we're going to accomplish this radical maturity, how do we get there? And a chunk of that is by being in communion with God our Father. To be in a sense of oneness with Him, and that comes through prayer. Prayer is the thing that connects us to God. Don Carson says this, Prayer is God's appointed means for appropriating the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Hear it again. Prayer is God's appointed means for appropriating the blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus. Prayer has at its root talking and asking God, making requests and petitions before him. But the end result of prayer is that we understand his blessings in our lives, all that Christ has for us. And we need his blessing continually. So we need to continually be going to God. I probably don't have to really theologically demonstrate the importance of prayer. Let me go to one verse, 1 Thessalonians 5. As Paul calls the Thessalonian church and exhorts them at the end of his letter, he's urging them in what they ought to do and be in practice. And he says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, always strive to do what is good for each other, for anyone else. He could have thrown the word, become mature. <laughs> you know, grow up. This is what it looks like to live and dwell together as the people of God, to be refining each other. And then he wraps it up with just these brief little commands. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Why? This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for you. God's desire for you is to be a people of rejoicing, praying continually, coming to God with your requests, coming before him with your petitions, with thanksgiving, recognizing how he is involved in your life. This is what he calls us to. If we're going to become who he desires us to be, we need to be in his presence. Prayer is to be our first response to what happens and our constant companion. And this is true of us both individually and corporately. Individually, we are called to have a prayer life. And so as we think about our prayer life, we think about prayer as individuals, those times when you come before God. It's one of those basic spiritual disciplines along with an intake of God's word. It's your communion lifeline. It's your growth and relationship. And we hear from God and talk with him. It's where we find our personal center, our, our peace, our guidance, our, our hopes, our conviction are meant to be in that communion with a heavenly father. That I am able, as Romans 5 says, to rejoice in the grace in which we now stand because we have been justified. We have been justified by grace through faith and are given access into the very throne and the very presence of God. 
And we are called to be this people of prayer. And so individually, I would call you today to know that you shape and desire and understand how you come to God in prayer. But I'm not going to really dwell on that much today. There's maybe another sermon or another time where we need to learn how to grow. I want to focus on the second part of this. What is it that we want to grow in corporately? Because this series that we're in, this radical maturity, is really part of the vision that the elders have thought about for us as a church in this, in this season. That as a church, we need to understand what is it to grow up? What is it that we need to understand to become mature? And I think a part of that is how do we mature in our prayer life together? How do we as a people of God understand how to come together better how to come together in ways that are more expressive of us together as the body of Christ. Because see, that's what corporate prayer is. It recognizes that we are the body of Christ together. The people who recognize that we desperately need to know God at work among us. That we are together in this mission. And we need to focus on the word and pray together to know his voice collectively where he's taking us, where he's directing us, what's his next mission for us. We need to bathe all we do in prayer as a people. We need to humble ourselves before his direction and cry out for his help in all we do. He alone can save, and we need to be praying for him to work in the people in our circles of influence for their salvation. You see, I believe prayer is where we can be the body of Jesus most intimately. Prayer is where we come together and our souls can be bared to each other because we bear them to God. We take our hearts before God, but it's in the collectiveness of being together. And our attitudes and our hearts are linked together so we know the Lord's presence in all that we do. It's really a call that we develop a culture of prayer, that we live and breathe and reside in this culture where prayer becomes our first instinct. Our prayers become that first place that we go to in service, in growth, in worship. That we start to say to each other, let's, let's pray about that. You know, that when we're in conversation together, you know, after the service, when we break into our little groups and we're kind of getting caught up about the week, that our, our intuition should be, let's pray about that. So that's the body praying corporately, even though it might be in little tiny groups all over the place. It's the intuition that says, Lord, we need to be bringing all this to you. That in our community groups, when we hear news, we just say, let's pray about that. Of course, there are going to be other pivotal times when we need to come together in united, urgent, and persistent prayer. Sometimes the battle seems more intense against us in the body of the church, that we call the church to these seasons of prayer. As I say this, I, I just need to remind us that, that God isn't impacted kind of by the numbers that gather to pray. I think we sometimes get trapped into thinking, oh, you know, it wasn't a very good prayer meeting because only 10 people showed up. God isn't in heaven kind of going, well, sorry, you missed the quota. Not going to listen today. <laughs> right? It's a heart that says we need to gather and pray. And it's not magic formula. There isn't a uh, sort of the right words at the right time to address God to have his, our prayers answered. God isn't manipulated by us. It's an invitation for us to come into his presence. And so as we as a church grow in this radical maturing of prayer, it isn't going to be about numbers. It's not going to be about times that we gather to pray. It's going to be about that hard attitude, that, that as I said, a culture that says our first instinct is we pray together, that we're drawn together into this cohesive unit to agree together so that ultimately we know that it's God who is work among us. Of course, how we actually do it is the complicating factor. You know, how do we say we're going to pray together in the midst of our busy lives, in the midst of our full lives that we are all engaged in so many different ways? How do we as a church pray together? I think there's 
urgent moments when we're called to pray. You know, there's those moments, those big things. Last year, we were in a process of calling a new pastor. We began the year in prayer. We began the year by spending really a month of dedicated prayer and praying together. We sent out prayer requests and everybody was praying. We were praying that God would lead us to the man of his choosing. And we have Pastor Dave with us now. He left. I think he's downstairs looking around the kids' ministry this morning. You know, God, we came together. And folks, a lot of churches in, in kind of the season of church life that we're in, it takes way more than eight months to find a pastor. God blessed us. That it was a relatively short process for that. Before that, we were in an incredible building kind of program. We came together in prayer. We've had times of sickness that we've called groups of people together and our hearts were united to be lifting people in prayer. We've had changes in culture in our society that have called us before the Lord in prayer as, law, as laws have changed, right? These are the urgent moments when the call goes forth and says, church, we need to pray. And I, I have to confess, those are the easy times. Those are the easy times to pray because you see a big need. You see something that's urgent. You see it right out there before you. What about the ongoing, though, the everyday kind of stuff? Because it's still, in a sense, urgent. It's just not as immediate. It's not as kind of in our face or it's not time limited. How do we gather together in an ongoing way? That's why we do heartbeats. Heartbeats, those evenings that we say, we're going to come together to pray. We gather together and we sing and we worship and we allow the worship of God to lead us into his presence and then we pray together, right? There's those calls to prayer. There's what we did in August. August, we said, let's set Tuesday nights apart to pray and we call people into that. See, if we're going to be engaged, we need to be intentional about it as well. We need to have times when you know what we're going to be praying about. It's why every week we send out what we call the prayer mail. The prayer mail, that little, you know, information sheet that goes out by email every Friday afternoon. It talks about what's going to be happening on Sunday because we want to pray about what takes place in our church on Sundays, that God would visit us. We give a list. We usually do about six church family names that we pray for each other. We list some of the activities of the church or important things or, or urgent or just kind of news kind of things that need our prayer. If you don't get the prayer mail, I, let me encourage you. All you need to do is uh, office at jamesnorth. Office at jamesnorth.church, right? Get in touch with the office. Just tell Jenna, hey, add me to the prayer mail list, and we'll start sending that out. Last count, I think we had 175 to 80 people that get that every week. If you haven't got it, I just, I heard of someone this week that said, you do what? I didn't know you do that. And it was kind of like, really? We announce it, it's there. It's not like it's a secret, <laughs> but it is by invitation. We want you to choose to get that. So if this morning you're kind of going, hey, I would like to get in on that. But what's the purpose behind that? So we have a sense that we're together in some things, right? So you're aware that these are some big needs. Community groups. We gather together in community groups, and the heart of that is our fellowship, and it is prayer, and we're encouraging our leaders this year to have a corporate sense, to have that sense that we pray together even though we're in these groups all week. So we're going to be sending out just kind of some prayer requests that envelop the whole body. See, it's that culture of prayer that says we're together in this. Did you know there's a group that meets every Tuesday to pray? Tuesday prayer group. Tamara, who was playing keyboards this morning, heads that up. It's an open invitation group. Every once in a while, we put that out there. If you'd like just to come and pray with a group, started in probably if it was two years or last summer, started just to be praying for our kids. They've expanded it beyond that. Right? Just a group of people that wanted to come and pray. They're part of this corporateness, even though they're kind of a unique kind of group. 
See, there are ways that we pray together even though we're not all together in one place at one time. I think we need some times like that. We're going to pray together this morning at the end of the service and invite you to kind of follow a little bit of a pattern because there's something good when the body just comes to God together in prayer. Lifts our heart needs up that we can bear our souls together. And then I guess the question becomes, what do we do when we come together? How, what, what's prayer supposed to look like? Well, we have a few examples for us in Scripture. Acts chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn there. I'm going to spend just a few minutes and think our way through this passage of Scripture. In Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 37, you have one of these passages where the, the new church, you know, that's just been inaugurated, they're just getting started, and there's just the transformation that's taking place. And they're starting to uh, experience some opposition. And they're gathering together. And as they come together, we get this picture of them in prayer together. John Stott says this, that Luke is concerned to show that the fullness of the Spirit is manifest in deed as well as word, service as well as witness, love for the family as well as testimony to the world. This all kind of flows out of this passage, and for our purpose this morning, and recognize it all flows from them gathering together in prayer. You know, that the spirits manifest in word, in deed, in service, in witness, and love for family, and testimony to the world. How is it all coming together? Because they got together and prayed. They got together and lifted their voices to God, and they heard from him together, so their hearts are united that they could move forward in prayer. So we're going to read this passage, and then I'll just highlight just some thoughts for us, just con particularly about this prayer. Acts 2, verse 23 to 37. I'm going to read this whole section, and then just go back, pick a few highlights out of it. On the release, Peter and John had been uh, arrested because of the healing of a man, and that whole thing takes back place back in chapter uh, 3 and 4. And they get released, and they now come back to their own people, and they report all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed they had any possessions of his own. They shared everything with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to anyone as he had need. And Joseph, the Levite from Cyprus, who was also called Barnabas, this son of encouragement, he too sold the field he owned, brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. The leadership starts coming out for the church. What a, just what a glorious passage, just full of this sense of transformational joy and energy that's taking place in this congregation. I just want to note kind of three things that comes out of this when you think about this group gathering to pray. The first is this. Prayer is a place of fellowship. 
Prayer is a place where the church gathers and they come together and they share with each other. Verse 23, Peter and John went back to their own people. It's a remarkable little statement. Say they'd been arrested by the Jews. They both come out of Jewish heritage. That was their circle. That was who they were with before they met Jesus. But once they met Jesus, they now were in a new circle. And they came back to their own people. There's a new fellowship. They've come out from the world. They've been separated from everyone they knew. They had a new people. Do you realize... You can look around this room and say, hey, you're my people. <laughs> this is my people. Right? This is who I now am connected with. With the body of Jesus Christ. Whatever or whoever or what, wherever you've come out of, you're now connecting here. And you have a new fellowship. You have a new group that you're siding with. And then verse 24 says, when they heard the report, they raised their voices together in prayer. What a picture of that unity that they were experiencing. Right? Together, they lift their voices up to God in prayer. My question is, how? How did they do that? Like, with one voice, they lifted the, you know, how did they figure that out? Did someone have song sheets ahead of time? Not in those days, right? Of course, Luke isn't giving us a full report. I mean, if, if all this took place, it was a five-minute meeting, <laughs> right? Luke is capsulizing. He's summarizing what took that place that night. See, they heard the reports, and they talked about it, and they said, what's happening? Oh, God, what, what's taking place? There's opposition. You know, Peter and John were arrested. They've been released, but these things are taking place. And someone said, wow, it's just like the Psalms. Just like back in Psalm 2 where David talks about those rising up against, and someone raised some scripture, and somebody else responded to that. And you see, as they talked and they prayed, and somebody says, we need to talk to God about this. And somebody prayed. See, they gathered together in fellowship. It's this night of heartbeat, <laughs> prayer. See, they came together in prayer. In verse 31, and after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Wow. What's that about? <laughs> Why is that significant? Well, it's significant because as you read through Scripture, in moments when God's presence shows up, things shake. Exodus 19 at Mount Sinai as they're gathering and the law is being given and God gathers and his presence comes over that mountain, it shook. And the people at the bottom of that mountain were aware God is in this place. Isaiah 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up and his robe filled the temple, what happens? As they cry, holy, 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 the foundations were shaken. The pillars shook. What's taking place here? This group in fellowship coming before God, and God by his presence shows up, and the place shakes. <laughs> and they said, God is here. Great quote from one of the early church fathers, Christendom says this about it. He says, the building shook, and that made them the more unshaken. Because <laughs> you see what happens next? They're filled with the Spirit and speak the Word of God boldly. See, they weren't shaken to their core in fear. They were unshaken because they said, we stand in the solidity of the presence of God. This is what our fellowship creates for us. It's the place of filling and of boldness. It's the place where we gather before to God. Our fellowship is with each other, and our fellowship is with the Father and Son, and our hearts are united together. How many times has this church experienced that? I can't say we've experienced building shaken, but we've experienced the presence of God. In our 137-year history, if you ever get hold of our little book, if you've never seen it, we have a history from our 125th anniversary. It's a great little read. It's amazing the number of times that it's recorded that God showed up for this church. 
I go back 17 years with the church, and I, I've seen God show up through prayer, you know, through our building and things that took place, growing, outgrowing 383 and God providing the school at no cost to us. This year, next Sunday night, we're meeting to talk about our finances, and finances aren't exciting except for this. It is the picture of God's provision. Our finance committee met Wednesday night, and it was just a moment of saying, wow, God, you, you've done it again. You did it again this past year. You know, and we're going to talk about it next Sunday night, but we just, we step back and go, Lord, you're faithful. And as we meet and we pray together, we remind each other of your faithfulness. Prayer is this place of fellowship. We need to meet to pray. Prayer is also a place of comfort and help. See, this group, they met together to talk through what was happening. Look at verse 27. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together and the people of Israel to conspire against your holy servant Jesus. That was so fresh in their minds. Jesus was crucified, buried, but rose again. But there's this great opposition and they're seeing it continue. And look at verse 28, though, the conclusion they drew. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. See, that came through the group getting together and talking it through and hearing the apostles talk about how Jesus had talked about saying, this is all going to be happening. Don't be surprised. And they came to this united consensus that all that was happening was in the will and power of God. What a night. <laughs> what a time to be together. To be convinced and assured that they were on the right road and the right track. Hebrews 4 says, Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Prayer's that place where we're going to find comfort and help because we lift our hearts to God and we listen together. See, prayer isn't just me saying, God, this is what I need. This is what I'm hoping for. This is, it's also learning to listen to God and, and receive his direction. And that happens beautifully as we meet together in fellowship and prayer. Finally, prayer is this place of battle as well. Verse 29 and 30, hear what they're saying there. Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Right? They're entering the battle. Lord, they're threatening, but Lord, we want to go out with your boldness. Verse 30, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We're, we're ready to go, but Lord, we need Jesus to go with us. In the end of 31, and they spoke the word of God boldly. See, this is the place of battle. This is where the war, the enemy is going to be defeated as we meet together and we pray and then God sends us out. The end of Ephesians 6, where it talks about the armor of God, putting it on, a, the last couple of verses are pray in the Spirit in all occasions, all kinds of prayers. Pray for all God's people. Paul says, pray for me, because I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might make a fearless declaration. See, this is the place of battle. And we need to battle together. This group reported the threats, the antagonism. And then look how they prayed. Look at the prayer, and let's, this is where I'm going to finish and lead us to pray together this morning. See, when they prayed, they did this. They recognized the sovereign God before him. Look back in verse 24. They raised their voices together to God, and how do they start? Lord, sovereign Lord... <laughs> All right, we come to you, sovereign Lord. You made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. First, they begin by saying, you are the God of creation. You made the heaven and the earth and everything in it. We bow before you for this is who you are. Second, they say, and you spoke. He is the God of revelation. 
God, you have spoken and we will anticipate that you will speak again. As the God of revelation, you will open our hearts to understand your truth. They went to a passage of the Psalms from David that spoke to their situation. And then they said, and you are the God of history. We understand what takes place is all under your sovereign hand, that even though rulers conspire, it's all according to what you have decided beforehand. See, this early church's understanding of God, there's three little verbs that Stott points out. The verbs are this, you made, you spoke, and you have decided. A great pattern for us as we come in prayer. Right, to be able to stand before God and start by saying, God, you've made it all. <laughs> and you've spoken. Help us to hear your word. And you have decided. You've decided in history, and you will decide again. And then they came with their petitions. Lord, we want to go out and be your mouthpiece, to be those that will answer this world. Andrew, you and the team, come on back up. As they come, we're going to sing a hymn together. After we sing this hymn, we're going to gather in prayer together. How we're going to do that is I'm going to encourage you as, as where you're seating, that you can just kind of pray with the people you're seated, seating with or turn around, pray in small groups. If you're not comfortable with that, it's okay. Just stay on your own. We're going to use this outline. We're going to use this outline and just say, Oh, Lord, you've made. This is who you are as the God of creation. And you are the God of revelation. You've spoken and encourage each other. Is there a scripture that, that God can give us as a people together today? And he's the God of history. You've decided. And then to lift some petitions together. I'll come and kind of prompt you a little bit more on that. We can't, well, if the Lord decides, we can take the next hour or so. But we'll take the next 10 minutes or so and just pray together this morning. All right, so listen to this hymn. It's a hymn to call us into God's presence, and then we're going to come and pray together.
Let's come to the Lord together in prayer. As I said, just turn to those that are around you, or if you're not kind of comfortable doing that, but I'd like you to pray out loud so we have that sense that we are praying together this morning. And just follow this little bit of an outline. Just if you don't know what to pray, just say, Lord, you made to celebrate his sovereignty as seen in creation. Just give him thanks for, in some way, you're aware of his sovereignty because of what he's made. Or he has spoken. Is there a scripture that just you can encourage and bless those that are with you this morning? Romans 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just pray something like that in the lives of those you're sitting with. Or third, you've decided. What are the assurances that God is at work among us? Personally, corporately, in our neighborhood, our city, our world. Just where do you see God at work? And just give him thanks and praise for that to remind each other. And then petition the Lord. After you've just spent a few moments, we don't have an extended period of time. So just in your circle, just you spoke, you made, and then feel free to just ask the Lord about some things. Corporately these days, we have a heavy burden with this whole thing of our property taxes. Our property taxes, we need God to break open some doors of government. Uh, MPAC, there's a decision, we're in court about some things, and we just need God to grant us favor with a couple of people that are making decisions. Let's pray about that. Just say, God, give us favor with decision makers. Pray for our church, a lot of transition and staff taking place. Pray for that. Pray that our elders and staff together as things settle out. And for future staff positions, children's and family ministry, for our youth positions. And then just a lot of ministry startups and community groups. So let's just take the next five minutes or so. Turn to those people that are around you and let's pray together and hear our prayers together before God. Begin.
just wanted to share something out of Hebrews. Hebrews 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest 
who is, ina- who is unable to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I want to invite you guys to stand as we sing one more song together. All about the confidence we have in boldly approaching the throne of grace. It's amazing that God is the judge of all. And yet his throne is so often referred to the throne of grace. And where he rested in the tabernacle, in the temple, that was called the mercy seat. And so it's just beautiful that our God, our perfect judge, is so full of mercy and grace. There was also some talk of, there was some radical talk this morning. And that got me thinking. Paul mentioned the word radical a bunch of times in the first, like, three minutes of his message. And I thought maybe we could we could worship a little more radically mature. And so I want to encourage you um, this morning. This song can get a little radical. So I encourage you to ra- radically worship him. By grace alone. By grace alone, I somehow stand where even angels fear to tread. Invited by redeeming love before the throne of God above. He pulls me close with nail-scarred hands into his everlasting arms. When condemnation grips my heart and Satan tempts me to despair, I hear the voice that scatters fear, the great I am, the Lord is here.
to boldly approach his throne of grace and to do it together, radically maturing, right, as God's people to see his hand at work among us. Can we have a culture of prayer? Can we just say together, Let, let's pray about that often. Andrew just said to me when I was just talking before we started to sing, we need to have another heartbeat. We haven't got one planned yet. Stay tuned. But I'd say in general, when the call goes out to pray, really consider it. Really consider what it means to give some of your extra time and some of your contribution to that. Whether it's gathering all together in one place at one time, whether that's just in smaller groups, or whether it's just after this service. Just to be saying, let's pray about that. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault, with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.